Salve tutti, or hello everybody from London, and in the case of Carolyn and myself from sunny Turin, which is severely locked down. Let me introduce who we are. Um, I'm Anna Summers-Cox. I started the art newspaper in 1990 and edited it for 12 years, and I'm now a journalist. Um, Cara Courage is head of Tate Exchange, uh, which is a newish platform for socially engaged art, um, very closely involved with the community. And, um, and she has 20 years of experience across the visual arts and architecture and urbanism. Uh, she's taking the Tate into completely new directions. Phil Opoko Jima, got that right, did I? Uh, AK, Lady Phil, um, is a former trade union act um, official and the co-founder and director of UK Black Pride, which celebrates LGBTQ people of African, Asian, Caribbean, Middle East and Latin American descent. And she's also the executive director of the Kaleidoscope Trust, the leading UK charity advocating for the human rights of LGBTQ people globally. She is a dynamo of social activism and a political and diplomatic lobbying um, is second nature to her. Caroline Christoph Bargakiev is one of the world's leading contemporary art curators with a biography as long as your arm, but I will single out her documenta of 2012, which attracted 700,000 visitors to Kassel in Germany. She is currently the director of the Castella di Rivoli Contemporary Art Museum. This past week, starting on Monday, we have heard about and we've seen videos uh, to do with the mental health crisis, which has been greatly exacerbated by COVID-19. We, I mean, you can hardly open a newspaper without hearing bad stories about people being deeply affected by it. Um, we've heard about what artists have been doing during the lockdown. Uh, we had a uh, two panels about scientists and doctors about talking about the proof that we now have that the arts help people who are suffering in the mind. And if you missed any of this, um, all the videos of the encounters on uh, the art newspapers YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about artists on the front line. In other words, artists who are engaging in the community quite often in um, places where there's a great deal of suffering or um, places of, of, of social stress. This is quite a new direction, relatively speaking, for art and art institutions, or, but it was preceded in the 1990s by um, places like Ashkal Alwan in Beirut, um, founded and still led by Christine Tome, which um, became a place for young people and artists to hang out and to have the kind of ideas that the rather relatively repressive society, even of Lebanon, um, did not encourage. Um, there's a townhouse in Cairo, uh, which brought very good artists to Cairo to interact with um, um, local people in the um, rather poor area of Cairo that was round about the townhouse. That was founded in 1998 by William Wells. And then, of course, there's Theaster Gates, very famous, the Chicago artist who has led on cultural driven redevelopment of affordable housing and all kinds of community activities. To, to, to bring um, life and hope uh, to underprivileged parts of Chicago. Uh, the point about all this is it's uh, a service to society. Uh, it is also a new opening for artists because so much of the art that has been created so far has been created with an eye to the market to actually being sold. But this is a role for an artist which is different. It is a role of the artist as an interactor with community. And also it's um, a blow for the defense of art against the extreme monetization of the sector. Uh, you need only think of the digital um, non-fungible token NFT $69 million sale uh, of the work by Beeple. I mean, that is the most extreme manifestation of something that has been becoming really acute over the last 20 years, which is uh, the idea of excitement mainly over the financial value of art. Now, Cara, um, when and how did the Tate get involved in such socially engaged activities? Oh, well, Tate always had, um, a, you know, various different types of relationships with various different types of communities. Um, you know, there are four Tate sites, there's community relations across all of those sites. But I think um, there was a really pivotal moment for Tate and it was part of a whole shift in the museum sector anyway, where what was happening in the context of, of education and learning within the museum 
changed from being something that was transactional, saying we've got the knowledge, we're going to tell you about this, to something that was relational. And it was looking, or it, you know, the approach to learning was that everybody holds the knowledge um, and bringing those knowledges into a, into a very plural, you know, multivariant um, uh, area of, of discourse within the museum. And it also used the process of arts to talk about an art object, but equally to talk about the lived experience. And of course, we can't do that in isolation, nor, that, nor should we do that in isolation. Um, and so it is, a, you know, that's when the community dialogue became an exchange. And at Tate in particular, it was that kind of practice of creative learning, this pluralistic pedagogy, that then gave rise to Tate Exchange, which opened its doors in 2016. And we work, yes, a lot with um, social practice arts. We, I work a lot with artists that have a particular um, political disposition to their work. But a lot of them are located in communities of place. Okay, but um, when exactly did this kind of transition take place? Is it is it something very recent in the last two or three years, or has it happened over the last ten years? I think I mean there's, there's been a journey of this, and I think there was a real shift um, across the museum sector, really sort of 15 to 20 years ago. And of course, this is building on a practice of you know, community arts have been going from the 60s and that whole turn to do work outside of the institutional context and, and you know, the site-specific, very in-place work. But there has been a real uh, uptick in the movement of this work, certainly in the last five to 10 years. And in my own PhD research, I mean, I was particularly looking at artists, social practice artists that were working with communities of place. Um, and, and that was something that I've seen um, in my own, you know, my own practice and, and uh, with the sector around me, certainly in the last 10 years. And actually the very, the kind of the change of, call, you know, of it calling itself social practice or socially engaged, I think also marked a bit of a shift there about the intent of this work um, and the, the political, social change uh, intention that a lot of the, these artists were working with. Now, there have been, there have been art therapists for some time, um, but they've been rather in the separate category. Do you, do you see a kind of merging of um, these socially engaged artists you're talking about and art therapists? Uh, I think there's a yes and no to that. Art therapy is a very skilled <laughs> discipline uh, that's, you know, standing all of its own. Um, and I think particularly um, back to the art therapy work that was done after the tsunami in Japan, for example, um, and it is anchored in some, you know, very, very rigorous practices that certainly not every artist would know or have the disposition to do. And that's absolutely fine, you know. But I think there is this crossover, particularly when what I've seen, particularly with 2020 and, and how we are moving on, for, you know, moving through 2021 and, and coming to our next normal, whatever it might be, um, post-pandemic. I hate to even say the word post-pandemic, though, because it's we're not there yet. We're still in it, of course. But the, the act of a radical self-care and seeing that narrative on the individuals, that's why it's taking care of your own needs first before you can reach out to help somebody else. And from your full cup, uh, bringing the overflowing of that cup to the benefit of others. I'm seeing that at a collective level. And I'm seeing arts being really at the forefront of that. And I think last year for many intersectional re you know, reasons around um, health, around race, politics, economics, have been traumatic for people. And I'm seeing the artists or you know, artists now step into quite a therapeutic space. I'm not gonna say that they're therapists and I'm sure they wouldn't say that they were art therapists either, but they are working in a, ther in a therapeutic space. And I see art here having a role in a regrowth, you know, the traumatic regrowth model. Art can have a, has a very definite role to play in that. Could you give an example of a project that you have conducted um, in Tate Exchange? 
one of my favourites. Um, I mean, we work with 60 partners and of course I love them like I would any child. I love them all equally, but there have been some um, moments on the change exchange floor that have been so transformational. Um, and one that comes to mind in particular was working with a group called Valley's Kids. And um, they come from the Welsh Valleys um, in the Ronda and an area of, of real socioeconomic deprivation that has been for generations. Um, I come from a very similar background and I could really see it when I was, when I was there, I could really understand the condition that they were coming from. And the youth club there, that Valley's Kids kind of congregated around uh, was closed due to essentially a lack of funding. And what that group did was bring all of the materials of that youth club, which had been closed, the materials were sort of spread across different houses and what have you. They brought it into Tate Exchange and they recreated the youth club there. And they had the pool table, they had the karaoke machine, they had dance classes going on in one part of it, they had um, theatre practice going on in another and of course lots of areas there just for chat and just that congregation of, of young people and Tate Exchange was open to the public so the public were coming in and being part of this and the opportunity or you know the children the, the kids that they're involved in it they owned that floor within the first hour of it being open I mean Tate Modern is an intimidating building and they got a whole floor of it there for themselves and they were engaged in this beautifully authentic conversation about themselves this is what it's like to live where where we live this is what it's like for me to go to school there this is what it's like when I'm looking at my future here um, and they talked around the issues of why the youth club was closed as well and they were talking to people from all over the world from all different ages all different backgrounds or interests or understandings of these situations or not so talking across a lot of difference from that age exchange floor. And it was fantastic. And one of the kids has gone on to university first in her village um, and has credited the, the, you know, the, um, the confidence she felt of being part of that age exchange program to that application going in. Um, and the youth club got its funding again. <laughs> it was a fantastic thing. And it, it's so important. It was literally the only place for those kids to meet other than to meet on the street was at that youth club so it's loss had social and emotional and psychological repercussions now you have great responsibility because you have to choose these projects for the tate so how do you set about finding them um a lot of the time they find us um and we we sort of we followed our nose as well when we first started tate exchange we were working with partners that we'd worked with for quite a long time. And actually it was the work with them that was then giving, you know, then to actually we need, we want to go deeper into this work and this is going to demand a separate space. And so we kind of went on that journey together with them. But of course, you know, they would bring other partners with them as well. And then we'd be like, oh, you're interesting. What's going on here? Um, and then often people would just come in and say, I've experienced this, this thing called Tate Exchange now. And actually, as a group that I work with, that I think would be really interesting. So we kind of, we sort of snowballed along the way and taking people with us as we've grown. And, but we don't choose the projects as such. Um, it's a long conversation to, um, to begin to work with somebody. It's not right for everybody for you know, all sorts of different reasons. Um, and every year when we, we start to work again with the group on their new projects, it's a real collaboration. Um, and we develop those ideas together, but it always comes from the starting point of, you have this floor, it is a blank slate for you to do whatever you want to do in it. You bring yourself into this space, this is your space to do your, your programming, to do your art intervention in. Um, and, and that's, I mean, that's part of the process of what we do. How many have you done so far? And do you have any sort of measurable outcomes? That's a rather, tedious question but um you must at the end write a kind of what happened next kind of report we do and uh, on the tate exchange website there's um some fantastic evaluation reports that we've done over the years um 
I don't necessarily think that Tate Exchange is a, a numbers game necessarily. I think you could have 300 people in there having a fantastic time and you could have three people in there having a fantastic time. And also we start, you know, depending on what's going on and, and some programs are more suited to a smaller number and some are more suited to a larger number. Um, but only since 2016 and obviously last year, our programming year through 2020 was slightly different, slightly affected by being closed from March 2020. But we've had uh, close to 600 different programmes since uh, 2016. We had um, an audience target in our first year given to us to, of 80,000 through the year. And we'd reached that within the first four months. And those numbers have gone up and up and up. And I think the last the last full programming year, we had around 120,000 people come through the doors, which is fantastic. And of course, I want you know as many people to experience the exchange as they possibly can. But it's when um, it's when you see change happen, um, and and that for me is the real marker of of success. Um, and it's hearing about how a total exchange experience affected somebody in the moment, but also maybe two or three years later, that uh, we know that we're doing good work. Um, and we're obviously always striving to do better. It's, you know, Tate Modern, you can walk around the gallery and you may see yourself reflected in the artwork that is on display. You may feel an affinity to the issues that it might raise or that you know who the artist may be and when you come into Tate Exchange though you have a voice <laughs> and so it's not just about being um, witness to something you're actually you're being listened to and you can articulate that voice and you're in that space and you're really being listened to and it's that kind of impact um, one that can be hard to measure um, but has the real value for us so it isn't necessarily about meeting metrics, it is actually about the experience of the space. Um, and yeah, that for us is our marker of success. Could you imagine something where people from the tape went out to parts of Britain to take the experience with them, or rather to make, make the, the, the space where the experience could happen? Um, I, yes and no to that, actually. I think there's something really powerful in having that space in the museum and one of the, the big reasons why our partners work with us is because it's you know them taking up space in Tate um, and the history and you know the cultural context that comes with a, you know a, a global art brand you know such as Tate that's a really powerful thing to take up that space um, and I would never want to, that not to happen um, and I think it's also very easy for Tate to go into any neighbourhood and go, hi, we're Tate, come and work with us. And people probably say yes. And I actually think, actually, no, is that really right for us to do? But I think what is right for us as Tate Exchange to be doing is to be certainly now in this last year, talking to our partners and saying, how can we be of service to you? Um, this space is not, has not been possible for people to be in for the last year. So that taking up space in that way has been impossible. Um, but how else can people take that space? We've done an amazing project with Lady Phil and UK Black Pride, which was an example of that, but happening in a digital space. Um, and that conversation is constantly evolving and it's, it's a pragmatic concern as much as anything else. It would be very difficult for that group from Rwanda, for example, to come into London again for all sorts of reasons to do with capacity and safety and travel and so on. So how can we still be working with them? How can we be a service to them where they are? Um, and I've talked to you know colleagues from across the world and they're really interested in Tate Exchange um, and doing a Tate Exchange where they are and the key to their success will be making it relevant to them, coming up with a model that works for them and their partners. Um, so in that sense, um, as soon as Tate Exchange leaves the space, it's no longer that Tate Exchange. It has to become something else. Ara, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Lady Phil, 
you have experience, I mean, you're a formidable activist. Could you tell us how you set about giving a voice to the voiceless and how do you help people, for example, overcoming shame or um, the incapacity to speak? Firstly, thank you so much for allowing me to be here in this virtual space. I really wish that we could meet in person and, you know, break bread and come together. Um, so Anna, your, your question's really like quite poignant at a time like this where we're in a pandemic, lockdown is here, and you talk about the voice for those who have been voiceless. So for many of us as black and brown, queer people, LGBT, that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, we have experienced socially distancing for so long, but what's difficult is the physical distancing, the ability to come together and, and really speak up about what our concerns are, what our hopes are, what our dreams are, what our aspirations are. And for those of us who are in, I would say very trying or challenging or difficult situations, it is the responsibility for those who have created platforms to be able to leverage that and amplify the the challenges that face our communities. So I guess how I've given voice to voice, the voiceless, and I don't want to just say it's me in particular, is by really identifying the trends in our communities, seeing things like, whether it's from Windrush to COVID and how it disproportionately impacts black and brown communities, whether it's the homophobia or Islamophobia that one has had to endure, whether it's about the structures which are systemically and structurally racist, that we try our best to really give ourselves a platform to shape our own narrative and tell our own story. Because when you think about marginalized, vulnerable and excluded people, they don't necessarily have the access to the platforms such as media. The media doesn't tell our stories in a light that is positive. It, it is almost damaging. So I guess UK Black Pride has been the vehicle that has allowed us to really give rise to our chosen family, bringing them together collectively in a place that is safe and also brave and you know, showcasing our art, showcasing our talent, showcasing, you know, our, our, just our beings in a way that is not done in any other place. And it's done through also an intersectional and intergenerational lens and focus that really is about inclusion and belonging and bringing people together. And when you create a place that is about belonging, safety and bravery, you will find that people start to speak up. You will find that there are more things that we have in common than we don't. You will find that those shared commonalities, the dynamics, the difference is ever so positive, empowering and allows you to build what is the collective movement of UK Black Pride. And that's how we create voice. And that's how we advocate for change. Do you provide um, a hub that people come to spontaneously or do you actually reach out? Um, we have our annual festival, which takes place every year, and that's in June or July. But we do a lot more of digging deeper into communities. So it's not just London focused. We work with whether it's our counterparts in Paris, Black Pride or um, Amsterdam, or whether it's our counterparts in the States or working internationally with our Global South um, comrades. But we provide I would say on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis, safe spaces, whether it's online, to be able to discuss what is going on in their region, in their area. But the main place that um, has over 10,000 people um, that they arrive at Haggerston Park, that is the place where we see ourselves and we we laugh, we jive together, we dance together, we celebrate together, we cry together, all because we're in a space that is for us and we can be unapologetically ourselves. The energy, the extraordinary energy that you've managed to 
arouse uh, does that does that come from from these meetings um or do you have to project the energy well i think it's a bit of both anna you know when you have people who have often been silenced or um, stopped from talking about their being or even navigating laws and legislation which doesn't include their being. You have to create a space which feels inviting and invigorate that space so it allows for voices to be heard. With UK Black Pride, I always say it's run by us and for us. So people claim their space. They absolutely occupy what they believe to be rightfully theirs. And, you know, it's, I, I can't even put into words, when you walk into the space of UK Black Pride, there is something for everybody, whether you are 75, whether you are a young person and, you know, are facing homelessness, whether you are somebody who is a, a migrant refugee, whether you're jobless at the moment, or whether you're a scientist or a doctor, you walk in there and it is yours and you feel so empowered to create whatever you see as your art. And how does this relate to the institutions, to politics, to local councils, to social workers and so on? Do you make an effort to, 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 to work through them? Do they make an effort to work with you? Um, and let's say that you're going to Iraq to work with Yazidi mm -hmm. women who, as we all know, got sold, um, raped and so on where the institutions probably don't help you at all. I mean, um, what, what, what advice would you give, to art, give, give, give to artists who are coming from the local population to how to first approach these ladies? Look, there's, there's also Kaleidoscope Trust. And I guess how we work in Kaleidoscope Trust, which is the leading LGBT human rights charity that works in the Commonwealth, um, we, try to make sure that if this is about movement building, capacity building, strengthening civil society, then you've got to be able to look at how you change hearts and minds on the ground, but at the same time, move through the corridors of power, so to speak. So that will be about engaging with diplomats, high commissioners, parliamentarians and other such people that hold decision-making power and influence to be able to really highlight this is the cause and this is what happens when you do not engage or value your civil society. So the Yazidi women that we're talking about, they deserve their rights. In fact, deserve is too loose. They should be demanding their rights and they should get it and require it, but it takes work and that doesn't happen overnight. It is about mobilizing for that change, but doing it in a way that is collective, making sure you can find allies. And, you know, the word allies to me is a little bit subjective, but there's a number of different ways that we approach our work. And with our allyship, whether it is in government or whether it's, you know, churches or other institutions, we have to explain the the nuances of our communities and why our space and our beings should be valued, respected and afforded the same access that anybody else receives. Phil, thank you very much indeed. That was a very good human account of what you do. Carolyn, um, I, I want to come on to you. Um, there are so many things that we could talk about. You did something very radical with Documenta, which in, in case people don't know about Documenta, happens every four years and it is probably the most important contemporary art event in the world because it takes so long to prepare. It's more important really than the Venice Biennale and the curators, each day always has one curator. Karen was that curator in 2012. As I say, 700,000 people came. Now, you did something quite radical. You took documenta to Afghanistan, also to other places in the Middle East, but let's focus on Afghanistan. What made you do that? Thank you very much for uh, your invitation and for being here, uh, all of you listening to this. Uh, what made me do that, and it was a very, very complicated decision to come to, was that documenta itself had been born out of the conflicts of World War II. 
And therefore, uh, when at the end of that war in 1948, people started to think about how to heal uh, society in Europe, uh, in particular because it's a European centered uh, exhibition, the idea of a contemporary art exhibition somewhere near the border between Eastern and Western Germany uh, seemed the best idea. And therefore I was thinking about how many conflict zones there were in the world um, at the time of my starting to work on, on the Kassel project and uh, how to somehow uh, transport the documenta away from being an exhibition of the highlights of contemporary art, according to a certain number of curators, uh, you know, a sort of touristic exhibition, periodic exhibition of international high art, back to pulling it back to having a very strong, um, let's say, social uh, role in terms of the role of art uh, in healing societies, in healing individuals and in healing societies. Now we know that art has been used as a form of psychological and social therapy in the West uh, actually since the 1700s and the 1800s with occupational th therapy, which had a, a strong development uh, uh, with the trauma victims of World War I. But we also know that for thousands of years, uh, uh, th the therapeutic effects of art were well known. Um, examples are many, many examples of shamanistic art uh, in Amerindian societies or also uh, the use of storytelling as a medicine in India uh, to as a therapy for various illnesses, the telling of certain stories according to which illness you have and the effect that that had on actual physical well-being. With all of this in mind, um, the history of, of art therapy in mind uh, and the history of Documenta and Castle having been um, gone through a process of post-war uh, conflict resolution reconstruction, also through the therapeutic effects of art, uh, we did a number of things that balanced what was going on in Germany with what was going on in the venue that you mentioned, which is the uh, Kabul and Bamiyan venues of the exhibition. So while in Kassel, we were uh, healing the environment and healing uh, unresolved past conflicts, cultural conflicts, such as the genocide of the uh, indigenous populations of the Americas uh, through acts that are symbolic, but also real. For example, the planting of a black uh, Cherokee apple tree in the gardens of the Documenta. In the picture, you see me doing that actually with Jimmy Durham uh, and the tree growing and the tree is, is there today. This was harking back to Joseph Boyce's 7,000 oaks, but of course it's harking forward to a world where the environment is less damaged and biodiversity um, is, is growing and the black Cherokee apple tree is well uh, on its feet. Uh, we were doing things in Kassel uh, ranging from that to a hypnotic center uh, where the artist Marcus Latins was, he hypnotized 17,000 people during the documenta one by one uh, to uh, resolve certain um, problems that each individually would have, or projects like Pedro Reyes' sanatorium, again, harking back to the idea of an, in, an art installation being an actual clinic for uh, psychotherapy through the relationship with objects, and people could um, enroll into that and spend the day at this art installation. The work in Castle, in the gardens of Castle, had its counterpoints with the seminars and projects going on in Afghanistan actually since two years prior to the opening of the exhibition in, in Kassel. It was done actually very um, confidentially and very publicly, but publicly in Afghanistan. So uh, we then told the story after the fact and brought many of the artists to a castle so there was an exchange. But some of the problems in a war-torn uh, area are those of culture itself and the the healing of individuals and people who are traumatized both physically because of maiming of the bodies 
during the war and during the Taliban period, but also psychologically, is determined by is determined by the fact of needing to deal with the destructions of one civilization. So one of the most uh, devastating things that are done in war is the destruction of the symbolic realm, which takes apart the morale of, of people. And therefore what needed to be healed was at once the culture and the individual um, psychological uh, 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 cases. So culture meant uh, restoring, for example, with the artist Mariam Ghani, uh, uh, restoring the uh, Afghan film, whole entire archive that had been saved and partly destroyed during the Taliban period. And therefore, at the same time as we were doing workshops and projects um, that were directly concerning um, people uh, and, and their individual uh, needs, we were also involving them in productive projects that had to do with, for example, restoring and renovating the films of Afghan film. Uh, Francis Alice uh, in, did something quite similar, working with uh, children in, in communities uh, on a project that was called Real Unreal. And the play of words was, of course, the real of the film reel and the, the, un, the unreal situation that one can be in when one is in a post-war zone. And the work with the children on unrolling and rolling film canisters in destroyed areas of town then later became an installation and presentation of the actual film made with the children in the destroyed cinema, which you can see has no roof, of Kabul itself. So that that is a very empowering, um, it's a very empowering form of healing through art. The fact of giving the possibility to make the art and to be proud also. I mean, you used the word pride before. I mean, to be proud of one's ability to take the shards of the devastated culture and work in terms of reparation. One last project that I wanted to mention was the sculpture workshop done by Adrian Villarojas, where he took a, a number of enrolled um, kids from uh, Kabul throughout uh, the city and throughout the areas, and then uh, worked with them discussing what that meant on a drawing project. And the drawing project in the end finally became a building of a drawing table in the Bagh Babur Gardens, which was uh, a table at the end of a large uh, mud wall that was collectively created. So um, this project, together with Michael Rakovic's project that was not in Kabul, but was in Bamiyan, where, as you may remember, in March 2001, the Buddhas were blown up. Uh, a short, actually, March 8th, Women's Day, which is an interesting coincidence, maybe. Uh, this became a workshop done in the um, caves where the Bamiyan Buddhas actually had once stood uh, to, re to reinsert the um, tray, the act of of carving that of the Hazara people that had been lost. It was a craft that had been lost in the area and of which um, I would like to show you a short two minute excerpt from a video. Oh. Do you know what the Afghans themselves thought of this? Did you get feedback? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, yes, we, we did work very, very closely with um, the Aga Khan Foundation and with the local government in, in um, Afghanistan at the time and with the University of Kabul, Kabul to um, and with also something called the um, Contemporary Art Center of Afghanistan. We worked very closely with the, all of the various communities and um, the feedback was constant. For example, there were always discussions on what uh, was needed. It was very much about what was felt to be needed by the local communities. So, for example, in Bamiyan, the problem that the local community felt was that the discussions were going over their heads. For example, 
uh, the UNESCO did not want to uh, reconstruct the Buddhas that had been blown up. Uh, the Japanese wanted to make them and send them over or something and so forth. Everyone was discussing above and not actually asking what people would have liked. And what people would have liked then turned out to be uh, learning how to stone carve again. Now, whether that means stone carving an iPod in the mountain two kilometers down the way or sculpting another Buddha, that is not the point. The point that was felt by the communities was the need to be empowered within certain skills that had been lost during the wars and the, and the various occupations. So uh, we were in constant touch and uh, Mike, for example, has kept in touch with many of the uh, people who took part in the sculpture programs. And uh, some of them are actually working now uh, in the archeological um, uh, digs in the area together with archeologists from all over the world. Uh, some of the people in the workshops of, um, of uh, um, Adrian Villarojas uh, have gone on to have wonderful careers. We also worked very closely with Afghan artists who were already artists like uh, Kadim Ali, for example, or of the Afghan diaspora, like Mariam Ghani, for example. That was very important so that all along the way, there would be no sense of a kind of uh, top-down process. And my last question before we get on to Michael Rakovitz's little video. Um, currently in art colleges, they don't really teach artists to be activists, to be interventionists. I mean, it might be in the air, but do you think it's something that people should be, do you think it should be included in the curriculum? Well, I, um, I would love to teach it actually as a subject. Uh, I think it can be because knowledge is always good. So um, learning from past experiences is always a wonderful thing. Uh, at the same time, what I've noticed throughout my whole 30 or 40 year career as a so-called curator or maker of exhibitions, Kunstausstellung Macher, they say in Germany, is that um, you, you can't, uh, in, in, in art, there's something called creativity. And creativity comes from not necessarily repeating what was already done. It comes from also mistakes. Sometimes the most fantastic things are come, come from mistakes. Whereas, so the, the avenue of say, artificial intelligence and AI takes us towards a statistics-based society where um, there are less and less mistakes and a predicted society. But we all know that then we're stuck with tons of biases in the, in the data bases that are used for the developing the AI and so forth. And so we tend towards societies that are homogenized. What humans, or for that matter, birds or mushrooms or trees or plants or not many non-human species tend to innovate through mistakes. So I'm not a Darwinian, uh, I'm more um, uh, of a different, if I have to use a metaphor, which is in the history of science, um, I believe in uh, co-evolution. So I'm closer to Lynn Margulis thinking and co-evolution as opposed to competition um, in, entangled with uh, mistakes and errors are fundamental. So sometimes I think the projects that have brought, brought the most benefit uh, to communities or to individuals in the notion of art and therapy, art and healing, don't necessarily come from something that you can learn at the university. I don't know if that's true also of medical doctors. It may well be. I mean, there's a part that needs to be learned at college and university and then there's a part that maybe has something to do with each singular individual's background memories childhood readings or what they're eating that day and so forth so i don't know if anything can be taught and at the same time i think everything can be taught it's a very good answer i thought that was very good follow-on from what phil had to say um shall we see the little video by michael rakovitz now i think we can just um, close off with this short uh, two minute excerpt from a documentary video about the project in Afghanistan 
that Michael Rakovitz made. And what you will see is the workshop in the empty caves where the Bamiyan Buddhas once were, um, were standing, uh, a workshop which he organized with the Afghan uh, sculptor Abbas al Adad and with a number of um, young um, Hazara kids from the Bamiyan uh, region who wanted to learn how to, how to sculpt a craft an ancient craft that had been lost during the, the decades of war. Thank you very, very much indeed, Cara, Carolyn, Phil. Um, I was quite inspired by that, I must say, and I hope that um, you, the audience, were too. And um, let's all meet again someday in the flesh. Thank you very much, Cara, Carolyn, Phil, and uh, to the whole team, and to all the many speakers um, over this week who have contributed to what I think has been quite a radical step forward in the approach towards um, the arts. Um, and uh, as I said, you can anything you've missed, you can see on the art newspapers YouTube channel. Goodbye, everybody, and thank you very much for being with us. <laughs> <laughs>